for ensuring sufficient bandwidth throughout the course of the webinar today. You are also requested to use the chat box function to submit your questions for the panel discussion to follow. I now request Mr. Rajesh Menon, Director General Sayam, to address our participants. Over to you, sir. Thank you. A very warm welcome to each of the participants for this uh, webinar. Uh, I, I, from on behalf of Siam, I would like to extend a very, very warm welcome. Um, just to explain the context, we, we at Siam are currently in engagement, engaging with uh, the government stakeholders across the various ministries and departments to understand and uh, look at how we can look at the policy measures to minimize the impact of COVID on the Indian automobile sector. So we're looking at several issues and we are engaging with the government in terms of policy recommendations and suggestions which can help in reducing the impact of COVID-19 COVID in, in the sector on, from an overall perspective. So three or four things which I want to mention to just set the context for this webinar. One is, of course, we are currently discussing and we made a very strong clear that uh, the entire value chain of the automotive sector must be opened up while announcing the exit strategy post lockdown uh, from 4th May onwards. So we have made a specific, special request that uh, not just OEMs, but supply chain, the entire supply chain uh, segment, the dealers, uh, the, uh, the RTOs, uh, the workshops, the service workshops, entire auto value chain must be opened up while we announce the exit strategy post lockdown. That is one, that's one, uh, uh, one element of our discussions with, with the government. Second, of course, we have been having a discussion with them on the supply side. Uh, whole is whole angle of supply chain, logistics, movement, uh, especially people, moment of labor, migrant labor, how do we get them back? So th those are issues of which, which will become very important once the, once the, uh, the sector starts opening up uh, uh, post, post fourth, uh, and depending on, what, of course, what the government announces. The third element, which is of, which is of uh, major concern to many of us, is demand. Uh, what will happen to demand once things start getting normalized? Uh, there are, we have done in Siam, we are doing some internal calculations uh, on what could be segment wise demand in terms of outlook in the coming months, which are obviously giving an indication that uh, we are, um, you know, we are looking at a degrowth scenario once again, which will be a back to back over and above the degrowth in the last year. So we are looking at a degrowth scenario once again for in the coming financial year. Uh, uh, and therefore demand is a big concern. We have made a request, as you many of you know, that we have been making a request for a GST reduction to 18%, and there are a few more things we've been talking about, need for a scrappage policy. So there are specific discussions we're having on demand, how to bring back demand, how to boost demand. The other element which has been, uh, which has been uh, upfront in our discussions is the in, uh, issue of financing. How do we, how do we look at low-cost uh, finance available across the value chain uh, in the dealers uh, to, in, for inventory financing, for consumer financing, uh, across the value chain, we'll be financing. We've also spoken about working working capital at low interest rates. So these are discussions we are having uh, with government across the ministries and departments. We are very hopeful that uh, government will soon come out with a stimulus package, uh, which which hopefully should also look at auto sector. Uh, while we keep the discussions on, I think we will uh, will keep communicating as Siam to all our membership, to all our stakeholders, of what's happening on that front. But in that context, today's webinar is, is extremely important. We're looking at, and this webinar, we're focusing very clearly on marketing, uh, changing retail strategy and, consu and consumer connect. So how will the, how will the entire strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis retail and consumer connect change in a post COVID scenario? I think that's the focus of this webinar. As Siam, we'll keep doing many such webinars of in relevant themes and we will keep reaching out to you. And I hope you will all find value in those discussions. Uh, but uh, now, with this broad context setting, I would like to uh, once again welcome each one of you. And I would like to also thank all the panelists uh, for agreeing to be part of this webinar. And may I now uh, hand it over back to Mr. Arun Malhotra, who will be the moderator for this webinar. Arun Malhotra is, uh, I, I don't think he needs any introduction. He's an industry expert, industry veteran. May I now hand it over to him to introduce the panelists and of course, take the discussions forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Menon. I think Siam is playing a very important role in getting the wheels of the nation moving. Because auto industry has a great importance in terms of 50% of GDP of manufacturing, 7.5% of GDP of the country, employing 50 million people. And he's highlighted four key issues which is being talked to the government. 
One clearly is how to start production. Second, to get the supply chain moving. Third is creating a demand. And fourth is removing all bottlenecks, whether they do finance or whether they do the logistics. Uh, we come to the topic of today, which is changing retail strategy and consumer connect in the auto industry. One thing which has remained fairly constant in the auto industry is if you look over the last 100 years, basically when the IC engines came, the dealer network even came. So in the last 100 years, there has been not been any major dramatic changes, whether in technology or this happening now, and also in the way we market, we sell and we service vehicles. So the question which arises today is, is there a need for change? And clearly everybody says the need for change is there. Now is the change in terms of reinforcement? Is it in terms of re-engineering? Is it in terms of reinventing? Is it in terms of reincarnation? Or is it in terms of renaissance? Probably you have points from each one of them. But clearly there are major changes which are required and we're discussing this. We have a very distinguished panel today amongst us to discuss this topic. We have Dr. Julia Saini, who's associate partner and head of consultant, consulting Frost & Sullivan. She's based at Dubai. She's authority in the field of sales and after sales, and has been a thought leader for the last two decades. Then we have Mr. Tarun Garg, who is Director of Sales and Marketing Hyundai. He has 25 years of experience in the auto industry across functions in various parts of the business. And uh, he's passed out from IIM Lucknow. So two and a half years, two and a half decades of experience he brings to the table. Then we have Mr. Yadendra Singh Goleria. He's a two-wheeler veteran. He also, like Tarun Garg, has 25 years of experience in the two-wheel industry. So whereas Tarun Garg brings the perspective of the passenger vehicle industry, Mr. Yadendra Guleria brings his rich experience. Of and last but not the least, we have Mr. R. Ramakrishnan, who is global head for customer care in Tata Motors commercial vehicles. Uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan, who is uh, fondly or well-known in the automobile circle as Ramki, has been there for the last 35 years, and we'll be addressing him accordingly. So this is a distinguished panel. Before we set on the discussion, I think it'll be idea is because the world has become a global village. Global trends, global changes are impacting every part of the world, and clearly is an automobile also. So there are clearly certain global trends, global best practices, and who better than Dr. Julia Saini, to take us through a presentation of what's happening on the global scenario and the learnings for the Indian market. Over to Dr. Julia Saini for the presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Malhotra. It is a pleasure today to welcome you all to our webinar and to provide you with a global overview on how we see the future of automotive retailing evolving. If we move on to the first slide, we see some key areas of transformation that we will be discussing today from how retail format become a basic expectation, creating new business models, and of course, how success is measured in this new digital world. The second part of the presentation will be led by my colleague Koshik, focusing on the Indian market and emerging best practices. Moving on to the next slide, although conventional channels, dealerships, as we know them today, will still see the majority of sales of vehicles until the end of the decade, we have seen a proliferation of additional and parallel channels that are really, really radically changing the retail landscape. We have the fully fledged digital flagship store like the Audi City Berlin, where instead of having a display of 15 to 20 vehicles. Um, Koshi, could you change the slide, please? So um, there you are, there's the digital flagship store. So the Audi City, City Berlin, you must have known it. So instead of having like 15 or 20 vehicles, we will only see two or three vehicles displayed here with the rest of the entire range 
being accessible via a digital technology. So displaying an unlimited number of models and configuration. Then in the middle, you can see we have the lifestyle store like the Renault Atelier in Paris or the Lexus Intersect in Tokyo. And here it's all about inviting people, inviting your customers to subtly experience your brand in a social setting. It could be a cafe, it could be a restaurant, basically a place of social gatherings. And then we have the pop-up stores. And these are the most ephemeral of all formats. They're here one day and they're gone the next, but always focus on high footfall areas centered around special events like a sport tournament, a concert, or a special time of the year. It could be Diwali, for example. In December 2018, Mercedes-Benz opened for one day a pop-up dealership inside a mall where children were the main customers. And if any of the kids fell in love with the car display, parents were able to purchase it but only online. Which brings me to the next slide and the next important channel, online retailing. Now, digitization is reshaping the way we buy and the way we service vehicles. We at Frost & Sullivan predict that revenues generated by online vehicle retail after sales and service will grow from about 120 billion today to over 605 billion by 2025. 95% of the revenues generated worldwide will come from Europe, America and China, half of which will be generated by online retail of new vehicles, whilst the online used vehicle market, driven by online marketplaces, is expected to triple by 2025, with Europe as the biggest market. In the parts and accessories business, global revenues are expected to reach about 78 billion and online service revenue generation close to 4 billion, driven mainly by parts e-retailers and service aggregators. Next slide. In the terms of units, vehicles sold, it means that online retailing of new vehicles will grow to over 6 million units by 2025. <laughs> And Europe has seen the biggest number of OEM initiated online sales platforms, even more now, as we'll discuss during COVID. In China, we can see mainly locally grown platforms that will continue to drive online retail of vehicles, with Alibaba's e commerce platform leading the pack. So, to just give you an idea about the numbers and the potential of online and digital retailing, on Singles Day in 2016, Alibaba's Taobao and Tmall platforms, it's like Amazon or Noon, sold 100,000 cars online within 24 hours. Moving on to the customer journey, as mentioned by Mr. Malotra, um, over, can you change, thank you, over the decades um, in retail, we moved from a pure bricks channel like the brick and mortar store into pure clicks channel, pure online retail. But what we're seeing now more and more is really the merge of these channels, creating the bricks and the clicks retailing environment. Now, courtesy COVID, all of a sudden, digitization in retail has become a reality you will have witnessed a drop of 80 to 100% physical visits to your showrooms. I'm not sure if you know the stat saying that we are now down to 1.7 physical dealership visits before a car is bought. Well, right now in COVID, we are at zero visits. And it is really anticipated that even after the lockdown is lifted, many buyers, many of us will expect the option of some sort of contactless transaction. Unfortunately, as of now worldwide, less than 50% of dealers are able to offer a vehicle sale completed online or over the phone with a home delivery. And before COVID, this did not necessarily mean the death of the dealership. But all of a sudden, we really have seen a proliferation of out-of-the-box solutions, new solutions thought about to bridge this gap. As a response to the social distancing and lockdown, Seat and Skoda dealers, for example, in the UK, have started offering live online guided tours and demonstration. You know where from? From their home, from their driveway. Dealers display cars at home. And in the first month of operation, Skoda UK delivered 2,000 hours 
of video product demonstration by dealers from home. And a team of six at SEAT handled over 200 calls of inquiries from customers in just one working week. Another example is two weeks ago, Group Renault launched an online retail platform offering virtual showroom tours and a remote e-signature process. So this, this has been launched by a vehicle manufacturer. But dealers who participate in this initiative receive the full margin and the full finance commission on every one of these sales. And this is without the customer ever having put into the showroom. So clearly, it is possible for OEMs and dealers to find a common ground when it comes to online retail in the future. Moving on to my case study, brief case study of Rocker in the UK. So in the UK, a dealership group that really transformed the way vehicles are bought is called Rocker. So Rocker worked with Hyundai in 2015 and now is the digital storefront of three major brands, Jaguar Land Rover, Ford and Mitsubishi. And the concept is really very, very simple. The stores of Roca are located in high footfall area in your shopping mall. So even in stores within a store, so like a Ford is selling vehicles within a Next or a Marks and Spencer store. And the concept allows people like you and me to just stroll into a dealership and browse. Maybe we would have never walked into a conventional store because we didn't even think of buying a car. And all of this is aided by product angels, like you know them from the Apple store. So they're hired specifically from outside the automotive industry, from brands like Tommy Hilfiger, Ralph Lauren or Apple. And these product angels are not there to sell. They're there to support the customer experience with the car and they're not paid a commission. But then if the customer decides to purchase the vehicle, this can only be done online, even from within the store. So if we move on to the next slide. So we're looking at how digitization was done online, but really the online user experience and the digital elements of the next generation, how we're used to interact needs to be bought into the physical retail experience. And this can be done through advanced technologies, AR enabled iPads that allow customers to explore the powertrain and the hybrid technology. Or we have virtual reality goggles that engage for high level of gamification that obviously increases the dwelling time at the dealership. Or as we know it now, the um, configurators that learn from multiple sources of customer data, from social data that you leave, from inquiry that you leave, and then they build this personalized, highly personalized product offering, like we've seen it from Audi. And finally, my last slide is around digital key performance indicators. So we have multiple technology investments that are running in parallel, and it's Hello. really important that we are able to monitor and leverage these investments. That is where digital KPIs are becoming more and more important within an organization. Digital KPIs are used to measure the performance of employees and processes. So both existing processes, analog processes, legacy functions need to be measured digitally, but also new functions such as the connected car or online retailing, everything needs to be monitored to actually see the return on investment of these new parameters. So new KPIs also need to be implemented within the company for the management and the leadership team, because if a company embraces digitization and digital transformation, it is key to measure the effectiveness of change and strategy at every level from the dealership to the CXO level at the OEM. And I'll pass on now to my colleague, Koshik Madhavan, who will give some concrete example from the Indian reality. Perfect, thank you very much, Yulia, for that wonderful uh, uh, setting the scene. Um, again, thank you very much to CM and uh, Arunsan for moderating this panel. So I'll spend just a couple of minutes uh, giving a few uh, perspectives on the Indian um, digital retail market and, and a case study to end with. So continuing from where uh, Yulia left, um, obviously some of the areas, you know, as a result of the situation we've had in India due to the slowdown we had in 2019, 
and coupled with the COVID-19 situation right now, we will see a lot more activity in, in a couple of areas, uh, such as connectivity, um, you know, um, vehicle leasing, digital retail, and uh, vehicle service and aftermarket as well. Um, in fact, I had the opportunity to speak with a couple of uh, multi-brand uh, garages in the past couple of weeks who are actually very uh, um, buoyant about getting uh, 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 enough number of vehicles once the lockdown eases over the next few weeks. So the aftermarket space might be bouncing back much quicker than the OE space in, in, in India. Um, having said that, um, one of the key areas that is likely to see a lot of activity is the pre-owned vehicle business. Um, um, in 2019, the pre-owned vehicle business was 1.2x the new vehicle business. Um, just last week, uh, there was an article in Economic Times Auto that said the uh, pre-owned vehicle market in India in the recently concluded financial year um, in, in, in March was 40% more than the new vehicle business. So we are already right now at 1.4x. In the next two years, by 2022, it is likely to become 1.8x. That means the pre-owned vehicle business is going to be almost double the new vehicle business. Again, the digitization is playing a big, big role. We've got multi-brand online aggregators. And apart from that, the um, organized sector is actually expanding. Uh, the informal, smaller, unorganized sector is being taken over by the organized sector, which is helping build the pre-owned vehicle market, again, driven by digitization. Most importantly, the OEMs themselves are getting into the pre-owned vehicle space. Um, of course, Maruti True Value has been one of the pioneers in the space. Apart from that, you know, Toyota's U-Trust, for example, Ford Assure, Hyundai as well, all the OEMs themselves are getting into the pre-owned vehicle space, which is going to give them not only additional business, but also help them drive new model sales, especially in the tier two, tier three, and the rural markets of India. Uh, vehicle subscription. Again, um, we see that as one of the high growth areas in India. Um, from the Indian uh, market perspective, we see that a lot of the younger customers, the younger generation customers, the millennials, um, are not really interested in the traditional model of purchase and ownership anymore. So they are willing to experiment and which is why the vehicle subscription space is growing significantly. I know we've had Hyundai and Mahindra enter this space in collaboration and partnership with the likes of Rev, Zoom Car, uh, Droom and so on. We see that as one of the key growth areas, especially for the younger generation customers who want to have the experience of owning a vehicle without the hassles of owning one, such as uh, maintenance, insurance, you know, service, spares, everything gets covered as part of the subscription service except fuel. So I think the OEMs will start um, accessing a completely new set of customers driven by digitization. Um, and, and this is going to be one of the high growth areas for the OEMs in the next 12 to 14 months. Um, just a quick comparison of um, uh, how a traditional showroom um, uh, compares against a digital showroom. You know, Julia clearly spoke about a few examples in, in Europe uh, with Rocker being one of the most prominent ones. Um, we see that the investment required both from the real estate perspective and, and, and the cost perspective is significantly cheaper when compared to a traditional brick and mortar showroom. And, and that is where uh, some of the OEMs today in India, the likes of MG Motor, uh, Hyundai and Mahindra are already experimenting with kiosks, digital kiosks and pop-up stores. Uh, that means the footfall where, you know, um, there is likely to be a higher share of customers walking in to these digital showrooms, um, you know, especially in malls in highly concentrated areas within the cities are likely to be ideal targets. So we will see a lot more of these digital showrooms, very small, you know, just about three or four people, um, in comparison to uh, a, a traditional showroom where there are 30, 40 people. Interestingly, um, uh, I was speaking to one of the uh, OEMs uh, early this year in terms of understanding what they look for in a salesperson at a digital kiosk versus a traditional showroom. Um, he told me, we are looking for storytellers. That means it is not just about talking uh, about the product, technology, or features anymore. It is about storytelling, what the brand can do for you. 
What does the brand represent? I think that is where we are moving towards. It is not just about product-based selling. It is becoming more of brand-based selling. Um, I'm going to end uh, with, with, with this uh, particular slide. So this is a case study of nayagadi.com. Uh, now this is uh, interestingly the first multi-brand, multi-category retail that has come up in India for the rural market. You know, um, uh, Arun San also spoke about um, how we can take the digital retailing to the rural part of India. I think this is a perfect example. So we have nayagadi.com, which is actually partnering with all the dealerships in their areas. And for one district, their goal is to cover 200 villages. That means very clearly, they're not even talking about tier two, tier three towns. They're already going to the grass loop level and talking about villages. So today uh, with nayagadi.com, we have the option of multiple brands on the one hand, multiple uh, um, vehicle segments. That means with nayagadi.com, you can purchase a four wheeler, a three wheeler, a two wheeler, and even a light commercial vehicle. So it's like a one stop shop that any customer can walk into and purchase any vehicle segment. Um, one of the KPIs that uh, the founder of nayagadi.com has is by 2025, they want to sell 50% of their volumes coming from electric vehicles. That means very clearly they're already targeting the micro mobility, shared mobility platforms where electric vehicles are going to play a big, big role. So going forward, um, platforms like these are not only likely to proliferate into the rural market in India, but also they are likely to bring together multiple brands, you know, multiple vehicle segments and offer, you know, um, financial services, um, partnerships with banks and banking companies and NBFCs to arrange for loans for customers. So it's going to be a one-stop shop for purchase and for service and aftermarket. So digitization indeed in India is, is um, you know, has, has a great potential, um, you know, uh, as, as William mentioned and, and gave a global perspective for India as well, going forward, we will see a lot more of these multi-brand platforms uh, emerging, which are going to drive ownership, you know, in the rural market. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand over back to you, Arun San. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, it was good to hear from you that the world is also changing, that in digital space is getting larger and larger. And what you talked about interesting is the combination of online and offline, which is working very well. And Kaushik, you said it's not only a global phenomena, there's a national phenomena which is visible, whether in the mainstream companies or a standalone companies. One interesting point Kaushik mentioned was the art of storytelling coming up. I always thought storytelling was restricted to Bollywood, Hollywood or Netflix, but it seems storytelling will become a lexicon or a part of the auto industry. Having said that, we now, we want to step back. If you look at the Indian auto industry, you, it's not of homogeneous, it's quite heterogeneous because there are three clear segments in the Indian auto industry. One is the two-wheeler, which contributes about 70 to 75% of the total auto wheel industry. Then is the passenger four-wheelers, and then is the commercial vehicles. There are some commonalities in each of them in the three different segments of the auto industry, but there are a lot of differences also. If you look at the industry, the way it's behaved last year, we had sharp declines in the two-wheeler and passenger four-wheeler of 18%, whereas commercial vehicles did dip by 28%. So I think it's a good idea before we jump straight to what needs to be done. We'll go to our panelists and try to find from them what has happened in the last two years and especially coming from the last two years to the last five weeks because there's been a titanic, titanic shift there. So what's happening in each of the spaces? To get a perspective of what's happening in the four-wheeler passenger space, I would request Mr. Tarun Garth to share his, his views. Over Thank you, Mr. Mal. Thank you, Mr. Malhotra, and good evening, everyone. Good yes, evening. sir, you're right. Uh, uh, you know, the, as far as the four-wheeler industry is concerned, we are coming out of a very challenging 2019. Uh, of course, the, it was challenging for uh, various towns. Uh, the acquisition costs had increased. Uh, you know, the insurance costs had increased. The customer sentiment was low. And of course, the biggest of them all was the BS4 to BS6 transition. I think we saw the whole year. There was a lot of confusion in customers. 
uh, when will the transition happen this model will happen when what will be the cost you know uh, there were various various companies coming out with different figures and and do i need to wait for bs6 or or or, or do i need to buy bs4 so i think uh, and of course in between there were some confusions around uh, gst reduction so uh, what i'm trying to say is it was a very difficult year uh, from a dealership perspective i think dealers are very important stakeholders also it was a very difficult year because uh, uh, the, the the initial estimate was that the market is going to be very good so the production was accordingly ramped up so the stocks were high and then uh, this the stress of bs4 to bs6 plus of course the financiers suddenly uh, uh, there was a big change because they suddenly found out that Uh, when this rotation stopped many of the dealerships were found wanting in terms of uh, the 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 accurateness of the balance sheets and uh, you know so it was it was really a very challenging year at the same time there were some very positive offshoots also uh, we saw that whenever some new models were launched a very good traction was achieved uh, some new segments uh, came up small mpv came up uh, a very good traction and by the time we had reached march uh, you know there was uh, this speculation about what will happen bs4 to bs6 will there be a fire sale i think all that ended and i think uh, as far as the four wheeler space is concerned uh, i would say that uh, uh, basically the oems were able to manage it very well uh, this fire sale never happened and uh, the industry stock actually reduced to minuscule levels uh, uh, you know by the end of march uh, so uh, we were actually looking at really a kind of a uh, 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 uptick in the industry uh, we were very positive now that the bs6 has come in uh customers will come back because now there is no confusion then many oems had also used this opportunity of bs6 to really launch new models so uh, so and of course we were entering the festival season of gudi parva and navratra so uh, there were very uh, some positive offshoots and uh, uh, at the same time uh, of course the covid struck and uh, last four weeks uh, uh, of course we all know that the showrooms are closed uh, you know, and uh, of course the production is off uh etc etc at the same time i believe that all of us uh, we and i'm sure my panelists will agree with me i think we have done a, a lot of introspection and uh, try to find out look where do we stand what can we do uh, so many new things have come up and uh, uh, while yes uh, uh, reasons for kind of economy being down and sales being down are a plenty at the same time going forward today i think i would also like to discuss some of the things which i think we have really found positive and how we can leverage those positives going forward uh, in in the year and in the post uh, post covid era so i think to start with i'll i limit my uh, opening to this thank you thank you tarun what you clearly mentioned was uh, there were trials and tribulations in the last one and a half year a lot of confusion and chaos whether bs6 is coming whether bs4 is there will the vehicles get registered there were some even confusions whether ic engines will be phased out and there was also this entire economy which was on a slow phase which was impacting and especially the rural economy so this was putting a lot of hardships but as you mentioned the industry braved it strongly and the dealers it did come out of the the cycle the vicious cycle and when we are seeing some green shoots coming in visible february march covid 19 struck so that's life you cannot change something which is part of nature this has been a challenging time and clearly passenger four wheelers impacted i would like to go to mr adinder guleria to talk and see is the scene very different in two wheelers because two wheelers the ownership the rural spread is very different from passenger vehicles all there are a lot of commonalities and before i go to mr guleria i would request all our parts all the people who are joining us i'm seeing a lot of conversation going on but please post your questions we'll be happy to take and we'll be taking a lot of questions in the in the second half of our discussion so please keep posting and we will address it to the panelists so goleria what's happening on the two wheeler front is it similar to four wheeler or there are some different dynamics which are part of the two wheel industry Microsoft. Microsoft uh, Mr. Guleria, can you hear me? Uh, could you uh, mute and uh, you'd like to have your views? How the market has changing, especially in two wheelers, as comparison to passenger four wheelers. Uh, 
I think we are not able to connect to Mr. Guleri at the moment, but uh, we'll shift to Mr. Ramakrishnan, uh, Ramki as we call him. Ramki, what's happening? Because the dynamics and the, the uniqueness of commercial vehicles is totally different. Commercial vehicles spreads from the small commercial vehicles, which are one and a half, two ton to 50 ton vehicles. And the interplay between fleet buyers, individual buyers, economic activity is very different. And this industry has taken a big hit. So just share your experience the last one and a half year and what are the learnings during the COVID-19 five weeks phase? Ramki. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, good evening, all. The commercial vehicle industry, as we all know, has always been cyclical. It's closely to the country's economy. And as the economic growth fluctuates up and down, the commercial vehicle business also fluctuates up and down. Typically, it leads the uh, economic slowdown and lags the economic recovery, which means that if the economy starts to slow down, new vehicle sales in commercial vehicles get hit first. And as the economy starts to improve, it is the last where the recovery is seen. And within commercial vehicles, the small end of the vehicle is not as much affected. The middle end, which is the intermediate and light vehicles are moderately affected. And the heavy vehicles at the upper end are the ones which are most affected during these cyclicalities. So cyclicality is not new for commercial vehicles. It happens in India, it happens in any market. The more mature a market is, the sharper are the cycles and the longer is the time for recovery. So we are also going through these cycles and each time when you look back, the previous cycles would have seemed to be a more benevolent cycle than the current one. And we definitely feel that what we're going through now is probably one of the worst. The COVID is just one month old, but let's trace back a little and see where the current situation started from. If I were to get into 2017, where things appeared to be good, and in fact, till 2018, second half, things were kind of okay for commercial vehicles. Some good things happened in the country, like GST, the growth in road infrastructure. In fact, the speeding growth and infrastructure actually helped in some ways. The, uh, better road network vehicles were able to trips in shorter time. The GST meant that tax was uniform everywhere. Also, it meant removal of check posts, octroi posts, etc., which also reduced the time that a truck took to move from point A to point B, crossing several states. Those were good ones. Now, later in 2019, we saw another legislation passed which allowed for increased axle load, which affected the heavy vehicles. Now, by itself, it's a good move because vehicles need to carry more load to become more efficient. This is what the transporters were demanding and the industry was also representing. However, within a fortnight of announcing that, the increased axle load was extended to the entire population of vehicles, which meant that as an impact of these three, better uh, roads, reducing cycle time, GST, no check posts, reducing cycle time, and the increased axle load, overnight, the entire trucking capacity would have gone up by anywhere between 30 to 50%. This is on one side. On the other side, the economy was slowing down, which meant lesser goods to transport. We do not have a particularly good monsoon, so lesser agricultural goods. Uh, lesser consumer spending, so lesser consumer goods, consumer durables. Now, when all this started happening, on one side, the capacity has gone up by almost 50%. And on the other side, you have a reduction in demand, which means more trucks became idle. So even good paymasters were not paying their installments in proper time. But on the other side, if you look at their costs, the costs were going up. Interest costs had gone up. The diesel price uh, subsidization removal meant that diesel prices went up much faster than petrol prices. And because of the increased axle load, every consigner was asking transporters to reduce the freight rate. So you have idle capacity, you have higher freight rate, uh, higher uh, diesel cost, you have lower freight rates, which severely affected the transporters' economics. Now this is accentuated as far as the heavy vehicles are concerned, whereas the passenger vehicles are a different cup of tea still dominated by legislations. They were not as badly affected. In fact, last year, the uh, year before last, there was a moderate growth. 
and the small commercial vehicle which is the last mile transport were less affected however it is the last mile transport and if the big vehicles have lesser goods to carry you have lesser last mile transport too and to an extent the small vehicles were also affected and all of this suddenly in one flick of a switch with the covid lockdown the entire economy came to a standstill entire transportation came to a standstill barring a few essential items the entire trucking has stopped gradually little by little little by little some things are limping back in terms of fruits vegetables groceries medicines etc and even though now the freedom is there to transport any uh, commodity across the country on the ground for the reality to come back to where it was pre lock pre lockdown is going to take several steps before we can see a kind of return to normalcy that's what we're going through right now varun back to you thank you ramki so very interesting times i mean interesting for people who are observers but people who are part of the industry i would say they very difficult times you said there were positive changes in terms of axle load increase in terms of better roads in terms of uh, the toll toll plazas which used to you know slow down traffic but all the new changes which came in added capacity and you said the way the changes happened the capacity in the industry was added by 40 50% so on one side we have the capacity getting added because of government initiatives and on the other side we had less capacity utilization which meant i mean obviously the fleet was operating at suboptimal level and also because of the internal pricing or internal competition the prices of freight did not go up so clearly a challenge but i think what ramki mentioned is the small commercial vehicle has performed much better probably the last mile connectivity the way it is working in the e-commerce era is helping it but clearly difficult times although a lot of people feel the trucks are moving there's no other vehicle moving so trucks are revived but as ramki said it's only in essential commodities but there are difficult times and a lot of changes would be required we'll be discussing that and now we go over to yadavinder we lost you at that point of time we couldn't get to you but tarun has shared with you the perspective of passenger four wheelers the way the evolution has happened or the way things have panned out in the last <clears throat> one and a half years is the story in two wheelers different because generally the impression is two wheelers is more rural rural has higher aspiration low cost of living more government spend so rural should have done better and have two wheelers but the figures don't suggest it we would like to have your perspective yeah i'm very sorry that i lost the connectivity in between and uh, once again very good evening to all all the panelists and all the viewers who have joined us and uh, i i would first like to say let like, we're looking back in the hindsight uh, especially in last three years the two wheel industry has dramatically changed because 2017 was the year when we saw the april month as a transition from bs3 to bs4 so that's a first transition which has happened and uh, post that we had the gst i think all the panelists i would not like to repeat has said the same thing we had the gst and in two wheelers speci uh, specifically in two wheelers the one big impact was also the era which became a part of uh, the era of disruption was the increase in the insurance premium uh, 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 hike which happened in september 2018 and post that the festival didn't respond the way it was expected then we had the new breaking norms that above 125 cc capacity and then must have the abs and then up to 125 cc engine displacement have the C, uh, combined brake system and then finally now we are having uh, the bs6 transition from bs2 bs4 to bs6 and specifically in two wheelers the cost of this transition from bs4 to bs6 is anywhere in the price point from 10% to 15% that's what the we can gauge from all the bs6 models launched so far in the two wheeler industry so this price point uh, compared to what we had on 31st of august 2018 before the increase in the insurance premium today anybody who wanted to buy a two wheeler on 31st of august 2018 and if he has to buy it on 1st of april uh, unfortunately we didn't happen that we haven't started the financial year so far in fy21 he has to pay 20 to 25% more than what he was to pay on 31st august 2018 it is a very big amount uh, seeing it from the background of 
who is our target audience who is buying a two wheeler if we leave apart the premium segment it is a big uh, jump of 20% to 25% in the cost of ownership there is that the ratio of buyers buying compared Uh, the points which he mentioned uh, clearly is that uh, one, this entire concept of the price increase, which has happened because whether it's insurance premium, whether it's a safety norm, or whether it is uh, the change from BS4 to BS6, and this increase has been to the tune of 25%, which is a dramatic change. And for an entry level customer, and on top of it, the GST is as high as 28% and road tax, if you are 10%, you're taxed as equal to what cigarette and liquor is. As one of the captains of the industry said, of the tool industry, that over-regulation has, has hampered or impacted very adversely the industry. That's the view which is there, shared by some totally, shared by some partially. But that's the way we're looking at it. But having moved, let's move ahead. The centerpiece of our action the way our industry moves is from a dealership. We're talking of digital, which will definitely be there, add value to it. But one thing which is clearly emerging, and this has emerged in the last one and a half years, is the dealership model, the way it operates, is under serious stress and strain. Dealer viability issues are rampant and are, is a big challenge. And there is also a challenge. We are not able to dramatically improve output and efficiency. So effectively, the dealership model is under a lot of stress and strain. And how, what we need to do, there will be certain costs we need to reduce or certain things we need to improve upon or certain new initiatives you to take upon. But clearly the way the dealer model is operating, this is not the most healthy way. And then the COVID-19 has struck. So coming to you, Tarun, if you put your hand to your heart and we are the industry hat, what do you think needs to be done dramatically differently, whether by the dealers or by the OEMs? to bring this dealership to be, you can say, more prosperous, more profitable, and then he'll be more engaged. Over to Tarun. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, you're right, sir. I think uh, dealerships are the backbone of the industry, and it's very important for them to remain viable. And uh, there are two aspects to it. One, I believe the last uh, one, one and a half years uh, has been a great learning ground. When, frankly speaking, and, uh, and many of my dealer friends have joined today, they would agree that a lot of indiscipline had come in in terms of how we how we maintain uh, our balance sheets, how we uh, you know kind of divert funds, what kind of expenses we do and try to book in the in the dealerships. So uh, I think that is one aspect. Uh, since all these last three years, like uh, all of my panelists have mentioned, they were very good years. So when the growth is there, when profits are there, you don't really look at so many things and so many inefficiencies come into the system. However, last year when all this uh, you know when the inventories increased. Suddenly, everybody became, uh, they realized, oh, what has happened? I mean, what has struck me? The financials also realized suddenly that, uh, okay, there was a fund diversion. The OEMs realized that the stock which they thought was maybe a one-month stock had automatically become two months because the retails were not supporting. And of course, dealerships realized that the kind of expenses they were doing were probably not, uh, not viable and not sustainable. So I think uh, uh, this was high time that we introspected. Uh, uh, and from a... Uh, I can clearly see that there are two types of expenses which we can see in the dealership model. One, which are very clearly productive expenses, direct expenses, which lead to, you know, increase in sales, whether these are expenses related to sales, whether these are expenses related to so many other activities, accessories, uh, you know, finance, insurance. At the same time, there are some other expenses, like probably for that matter, inventory. Uh, I would not go into who is responsible, I'm sure as, a, as, a, as partners, we are all responsible that somewhere down the line, we can clearly see that unnecessary inventories creep into the system because of maybe data not being correct, because of some kind of forecasting systems not being available. And also, I would say, you know, our memory is as short as last five days. Uh, if, the, if, if suppose we are coming out of a Navratra period and you ask somebody how's, how's going to be a sales, they will project 25% growth, 30% growth. And in a bad period, suddenly we are we straight away come to minus 20, minus 30. So I think some kind of a balancing is required there. 
uh, where we can see the rental model. I think again, uh, uh, very clearly, rental models have gone, um, uh, you know, uh, heyway. And if you see, there are some dealerships who have really believed in their own assets, and those dealerships are still strong. COVID or no COVID, the balance sheets are strong. Uh, they have been investing using their reserves and surplus. They have not been over leveraged in terms of debts, and they are doing fairly well even in these times. Uh, I mean, what I mean to say is that they, they are able to manage the cost in these times. So uh, we need to see, really, really see that, uh, okay, the rentals, are they unnecessarily high? Can we really moderate the rentals? Uh, what actually is the ideal size of a showroom? Do we need to really kind of, uh, you know, make some changes there? Then, you know, some of the other things, like I was just trying to see when a customer comes to a showroom to buy a car, how many people he actually meets? And I was just saying, maybe he meets uh, close to 15 pe different people the journey of our car buying. While we may say that we have gone digital and 90% of the customers are going digital in, in their pre-sales experience, but that is not true. You know, right from receptionist to the DSC, to the team leader, to the accessories, to the delivery boy, to the insurance guy, documentation, finance. I mean, there's a hell lot of people who, so I think we need to really do a kind of a multi-skilling uh, and especially in the COVID era when we would want a kind of a as much as possible contactless selling. I'm not even coming to digital, even in terms of the showroom. I think there are a lot of things which can be changed. Uh, uh, and of course, OEMs also have to support. Like last four weeks, the training, training builds itself. I mean, you know, we, ha we have these trainings in hotels where our trainers go and the dealership manpower comes. They're there for two days. And uh, last four weeks we have seen it is working so beautifully. Online training is working perfectly well. So I think we need to really sustain this kind of a behavior. Then demonstration to the customers at home, online demonstration of customers at home. I think this is very, very important. So while the data suggests that the showroom visits have come down, like even Julia mentioned, uh, from say 3, 3.5 to 1.7, I believe every showroom visits also leads to some kind of an extra expense. So this is an opportunity for us to really look at those expenses. Uh, for the manufacturers, yes, we have to keep the excitement going. We have to find new ways of communicating with the customers. Uh, rural uh, lockdown, in fact, will be will really test us because we all know that it's not as if it's like a zero-one game that in one day the lockdown will open all across the country. It will be graded. Uh, some markets will open up. Uh, some uh, rural markets may open up much better than the, than the urban markets. So we will have to find new ways of communication. Uh, more regular BTL, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, which has given us results. But I think this is a time to really innovate and maybe empathize more with the customers and reach him with different kind of a strong kind of a content and in a way which is which is easily uh, understandable. So uh, so it has been a big uh, uh, learning ground, I think, and a lot of things will change uh, going forward. So Tarun, uh, you clearly mentioned two things. One, because of too much success for two three years, a lot of you can say financial mismanagement or financial too much spendings creeped into the system, any efficiencies creeped into the system. And today it has come to roost to us. Clearly, but you also grudgingly did admit that even manufacturers have a role to play. We probably have made dealers over-invest, whether in terms of infrastructure, whether in terms of stocks. So clearly there is a, a time to reduce our thing, reduce our stocks, maybe reduce our, even the infrastructure which is required. And one very interesting point Tarun mentioned is we don't, we are still not following the concept of single point interface at dealerships. A person has to navigate between the number of people at the dealership, even for buying a car or even for a time of servicing. So can we simplify it? Can we combine roles? I think this is an action jointly. A lot of realization has dawned in the last five weeks that some of the things which we were doing, we could have done away with. So clearly this is the challenge we are seeing. Coming to Yadavinder, you are there. Uh, you know, two-wheelers, fortunately, don't have big infrastructures. I mean, and most 60% of the sales do happens in their sub-dealers. So clearly, is infrastructure a challenge? Stocking has been a challenge, which I do understand clearly. And how does the problem, which is on working capital, which has plagued a lot of dealerships in the, in the passenger four-wheeler, is that the same phenomenon which was visible in the two-wheel industry? Uh, again, I'm sorry. So, uh, as far as two wheelers are concerned, uh, 
Uh, again, I would say it depends on the individual maker's product portfolio, how much their dependency on the secondary network. So it depends de definitely on the product portfolio, whether it's a premium product or it is in the range of 1 lakh or 50,000 or lower than 50,000. Depending on the kind of profiling, the dependency uh, is higher on self, your own network or on the secondary network. Now, that is one. But yes, as Mr. Tarun mentioned, there will be a uh, big uh, challenge as far as uh, the rural or the tier three towns are concerned in terms of their digital upgradation and that you know the mindset so uh, moving forward the working capital again i would say uh, again on the individual maker see it is a time to introspect for every one of us that how you, we have been doing it whether it was a cash and carry or we are basically playing on the dispatches and less on retail if everything is well on the front line, that is the consumer is coming, customer is buying from the dealership, dealership will definitely ask for more orders and in the kind of MTOC which is there in the demand. But sometimes, you know, the over excitement or even around the new models, there is a tendency of uh, sometimes overstocking and in anticipation of some forecasts which always happen. It doesn't mean we should not have a forecast. Otherwise, you cannot make a new model. You know, you must have a hypothesis as well as some market research. That's why the new models are, you know, launched in the market. But fairly, it's time to again recalibrate the kind of stocks we need to keep. Uh, and uh, for that, the entire value supply chain also have to again recalibrate because right now, uh, once we see the geographical spread of our country, the average transit time is always seven to eight days. So if you have to bring down the inventory level, the dealership, then you need to have some warehousing or need closer to the uh, uh, to your dealership and your network. Some network uh, in the uh, when we talk about the seven sisters, it takes almost two weeks for the product to reach that particular market. As a manufacturer, you cannot have a factory at every uh, individual location to feed it to your customer. But still, with the only with economies of scale, you can afford to do that. But if you have uh, a limited segments to play for, then obviously your manufacturing facilities are also limited and uh, confined to a particular geographical regions. So, but uh, we need to re really recalibrate in terms of what kind of inventory levels have to be maintained. And then again, talking to our bankers also, because there are sometimes the dealers who are good on financial management, they are able to negotiate better rate with the, for their inventory funding needs from their respective bankers because they have multiple exposures. The others, the manufacturer had to come forward and give some assurance and some negotiation and then provide that uh, working capital at uh, uh, competitive rates to their respective uh, business partners. So all, uh, all in all, based on what COVID has brought in, there is definitely a stress in the market. And there, there will be two kinds of things which we are going to see. We are talking of post COVID. I think we need to divide it also into two uh, particular phases. One is post lockdown. Second is post COVID because COVID has not gone. It is lockdown, which is going on third or maybe in many places, even lockdown is not going to go because of the containment zone or because of the red zone being declared by the government. So post lockdown, we will see a definite change in the behavior of the customer, more isolation or, you know, the social distancing. So accordingly, we need to start talking to them and uh, engaging with our customer. But at the same time, some behavior will stay for a longer period. Some things are going to come back to their original. It's very difficult to judge today that what will become the new way of norm, that there will be a new way of norm, a new way of life, and new way of behavior of the customer. But certain things are definitely going to come back. So we need to see how it is balanced out post-COVID. So, you know, uh, two things. One an interesting thing which I found what uh, uh, Mr. Valeria has been saying, he's used the word recalibrating a lot. Now, recalibrating for the manufacturer, recalibrating for the dealer. So we're talking recalibrating. But before we jump to... Uh, Ramki, there's one, two questions which I want to raise both to Tarun and, and also Mr. Guleri. I want a short answer. One of the advantages of GST is that today you don't have to, if you have to transfer stocks, you don't have to open depots in every state. You can have one depot at the entry of, say, uh, Bengal somewhere in Kharagpur, one depot somewhere in Tumpur for South, 
one somewhere in Manisar for North. And obviously, the time then, if you transfer your stocks, the time to reach to dealers or to replenish their stocks would be much lower. So is the industry thinking of that? Because that was a change. And the second part is there's too much thing being said about everybody believes that, you know, uh, digital is the panacea of everything. It is like the Brahmastra or it is the Sanjeevani booty for the auto industry. Will it add efficiency or it can reduce cost dramatically? So two questions. Are they, is the industry ready for stockyards? And is just digital only an improvement, enhancement, or is it a game changer? Tarun, short answer. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, the short answer is, of course, yes, industry is ready for stockyards. At the same time, I think it's very important that we have good forecasting systems because it's very easy to have, uh, have stockyards. But then who is responsible for the inventory in these stockyards? You know, if the dealers know that it is all manufacturer's inventory, you, you understand what will happen. If the <laughs> manufacturers feel that centrally, you know, there are so many systems by which we are able to control. So I think stockyards is definitely the answer, but we need to have a very good order to delivery system. We need to have manage vintage. We need to manage who is bearing the cost of that stockyard because the stockyard will lead to definitely a lot of efficiency in the system. And then we need to see how this cost, the additional cost of the stockyard is borne between the, the entire ecosystem. I think that is first part of it. The second part of it is on the digital. So frankly speaking, like I said, digital in auto industry is, has been so far limited to maybe pre-sale or booking of the vehicle. For the first time, now we are looking at probably end-to-end -end or the entire 360-degree digital experience. And I strongly believe that the time has come and of course, Julia also shared in her presentation that yes, I think digital can actually not, be a, a, not only be a tool for reducing cost, but also it can be a tool for increasing demand. And not only in sales, sir, I think sometimes we, we, we make this mistake of, of, of uh, you know, using digital only as a sales tool. What we find, in fact, in my organization is that more than 60% of the inquiries we receive on digital are, uh, are linked to surveys and accessories. So I think the entire, uh, 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 this, the entire ecosystem has, has to be really looked at. And this is for the benefit of everybody. Let me tell you, while sometimes sales salespeople are very much tuned to digital, both at the dealerships as well as in the OEMs, but the other uh, other areas are definitely uh, sometimes not really tuned. So I think it is high time we really look at those other areas also, because if we are able to close the loop there, I'm sure many many more revenue opportunities will come in. So Tarun is saying clearly stockyards are possible, but we have to look at the flip side. You still have to do better forecasting. And second of all, there has to be a sense of discipline. Otherwise, the stockyards will become add inefficiencies and add cost. Uh, coming to Israel area, you know, one thing on digital, which Tarun has mentioned, that rather than limiting it to sales, it should become a powerful customer retention tool or a lifetime value of the customer or a customer relationship. The way you see, because most 70 to 80% of sales of two-wheelers is in rural, do you see digital really working out rural to expand market? Because expanding footprints is an expensive proposition and also on the stockyard issue. So what is your view on this, Mr. Guleria? Yeah, first is that um, um, though I have been told specifically not to talk about your individual company, but yes, uh, yeah, uh, we, we are already... <laughs> wearing the industry has, not wearing the company has. Yeah. Yeah, we are already into warehousing, and uh, but the key point, as Mr. Tanu also pointed out, that we need to go to the next level of improving the efficiency in managing these multi warehouse operations because you have multiple factories, multiple warehouse, and managing the inventory and the stock. Because India is a you know as you in the beginning you rightly mentioned we are talking of a homogeneous yet heterogeneous market. The model which sells in the eastern part of the country doesn't sell at all in the southern part and what sells in the north part doesn't sell in the west part. So this combination and having the right kind of MTOC by very efficient backend software or you know the super uh, software which will be there to manage, it should be technologically backed to help uh, the people to manage inventory well so that the real benefit which we want to derive that is the efficacy of uh, the stock management dealer should not keep a very high inventory at then there and when, when as and when the customer is there he should be in a position to give them quickly within a week's time or with ready delivery or so so that is one so but definitely it is in second point regarding the digitization yes 
more than ever in the covid time everybody has gone more and more usage of internet but i think everybody also went to a journey of inner connect not only internet but inner connect so that is when we have gone inside and we started looking or you know uh, seeing more of our job the way we have been doing uh, they have been traditional way of doing so it is time that we need to come out of those mindset of traditional way of doing so instead of corporate identification program which all of us mention or name so in the auto industry with large boards and you know outside and inside uh, standardization i think time has come for digital identification program from cip to dip this is the time and we should you know sincerely work on that so mr blair has mentioned cip to dip and when you were mentioning this you know uh, not only of uh, digitization but introspection and introspection hindi is antaratma ki awaaz sunna apne man ki awaaz sunna so if i try to say julia you hear your inner voice and then a voice sometimes tells you the truth but you don't follow it you know that i remember you know so we talk about renaissance and this entire thing you know what is renaissance it was challenging old myths where the castles of faith had begun to crumble down the desires of inquiry were active and on the world was visible a new dawn of freedom so we're talking that now coming to ramki uh, i will play the devil's advocate with you so don't uh, uh, take me take me for what it is worth a lot of people say as far as the commercial vehicle industry is concerned the showrooms or infrastructures are not in the main cities they are on the highways so rentals or construction cost should be less second trucks they they even don't move on trucks they, i mean if you order some truck it can reach in four days and stocking is really not required but there is a heavy discounting between dealers and between companies happening which is pulling the viability down what do you do say on that is the challenge very really different in commercial vehicle or is it the same we are talking of two wheelers and four wheelers thank you arun uh, that's an interesting question uh, commercial vehicles is not homogeneous and commercial vehicle customers are not one homogeneous lot so mm -hmm. you have different kinds of models which need to be sold in different ways you have different kinds of customers who have to be approached differently i give you a few examples to explain what i mean a very large fleet operator who has been in the trucking industry for several years and is familiar with the models because he's regularly appraised he doesn't come to a showroom at all the transaction happens in his premises the pre selling selling financing everything happens at his premises and someone comes and delivers the vehicle after its body built he probably doesn't even see the uh, chassis himself till the uh, vehicle is body built and delivered and then maybe he will do a puja and press the vehicles into service he doesn't need a showroom at all now on the other hand there is there is a first time buyer i'm going to the other end of the spectrum a first time buyer who's buying a commercial vehicle for the first time in his life possibly buying a vehicle for the first time in his life it's hard earned money whatever little he has saved he's probably hawking his wife's jewelry or his uh, ancestral property and mustering up some down payment to buy this asset in the hope of earning a livelihood he has got fear at every step with everyone he wants to be very thorough in ascertaining and satisfying himself that he's got the right thing so even before he approaches the showroom he will of course do his due diligence talk to his friends talk to his relatives go to the mandi see the vehicle how it is performing talk to the user he will do all that and after that he will still come to a showroom want to understand who are the people who is going to sell this vehicle to me are they trustworthy are they nice to me are they knowledgeable he will want to see the vehicle how does it look is it the same as what uh, someone's vehicle which i have seen is it the same as that he definitely wants to see it in a showroom it may not be a large showroom but he wants to see the physical vehicle so different customers want different things then again commercial vehicles are not confined to highways or rural areas you have vehicles which are flying inside the city and if you take the last mile transport predominantly it's happening inside cities for someone inside the city to go to a highway to look at a vehicle and buy is a huge headache if you take a city like mumbai or delhi or chennai or kolkata if you have to go from the heart of the city to the highway to buy a vehicle you will spend a couple of days because of the number of visits you will make so you need showrooms within the heart of the city maybe smaller showrooms 
So this is how the model has come so far. So you need city-based sales outlets. You need it. You need city-based showrooms. And of course, there are people to whom you have to send your expert salespeople who are knowledgeable, experienced, so that they can transact meaningfully with a very knowledgeable customer. So it's a spectrum of needs. So to say that all commercial vehicles or on the highway don't need a showroom, looking at the past at least, is a stretch of imagination. So I, I, very many I, things I, can I, change. I slightly wider. Yes, you can continue. Yeah. Yeah, how will it be in the future? Very many things can change. The awareness that a customer gets today, even before he approaches a manufacturer to buy, is a lot more than before, and he has many more means to do it. Unlike what many people think, a commercial vehicle customer is also pretty internet savvy. The second and the third generation is now in the uh, business, running the business. They make their uh, comparison in notes sitting in their offices and they're well informed before they don't come to a showroom. They call five manufacturers to their office and they transact business. So do uh, these guys need a showroom? Not at all. But do these, do these people need someone very knowledgeable to engage with them? Definitely. Because if the dealership does not do that, then the customer is likely to take away much more than the dealership was originally willing to offer. You refer to the discounting game, some of what is happening today is the demand supply equation. Some of what is happening today is the number of competition. Some of what is happening today is an aware buyer. But have the dealerships commensurately increased the skill acumen of the people who transact business with their big customers? It's different for different folks. People who have done it walk away with a better realization. People okay. who got it saves people get average realizations. Whereas people who are still taking, sticking to the traditional method of a performer invoice and a deliver and a demand draft collector, they're probably putting a lot of money on the table to make the same transaction. Okay, Ramki, uh, what I hear from you clearly, yeah, I hear from you clearly is that uh, the first of all, commercial vehicles can't be put in one brush. There are small commercial vehicles, there are intermediate commercial vehicles. The second point which you mentioned, and uh, uh, this could be news to people uh, who think that selling a two-wheeler or a passenger four-wheeler is a difficult thing, that selling a commercial vehicle, since it is used operating, maintaining, the selling is a much more consultative, much more detailed process. And you said the market dynamics ensured that there was discounting. Now we jump to the next part, and I would like all my, pa my panelists to be slightly brief because we need to keep a lot of questions, time for the questions from the, part, from the people who are viewing this program. So one question which is clearly coming out, a lot of people say there are a lot of dramatic changes will happen. Post-COVID, maybe something which has started. So some may be valid for certain segments, some may not be valid. So people are saying IC engines versus electric. Hmm? Second would be personal vehicles versus shared vehicles because they say now with this post-COVID crisis, everybody wants personal space or personal vehicles. Then would be owned model versus subscription model. You don't want to own an asset. So, the customer will change also. So what are the changes you see happening? And these trends of electric, or maybe in terms of uh, shared vehicles or personal vehicles, Tarun, just your brief on that. Yeah. What are the changes you see happening or what do you think the changes can get postponed also? So, uh, sir, if we see the China model, because that's the only model which we see, uh, we can say kind of post-COVID. So, very clearly, there is a shift uh, from shared mobility to personal mobility. And, and it looks very logical also. So, I believe that, yes, definitely in the initial period, uh, at least, customers will want that, yes, this is my office space, which is my space. This is my home space, which is my space. And the second space and the third space is going to be my car space. So clearly, I think some of the customers who are not thinking of buying cars would, uh, would look at shared mobility. Yes, sir, you talked about subscription. I think subscription, uh, many customers, and Julia also talked about it, that many customers don't want it, don't want to own the asset, but they want to experience uh, the asset. So, and we have seen this happen in India. I think some of the companies are really doing very well. And I believe this, this concept of subscription probably will get, gather momentum uh, post-COVID. So uh, this is definitely, definitely going to happen. Uh, in terms of EVs, yes, sir, I also read that uh, oil prices have come down. So probably uh, EVs, uh, you know, will not happen. But I believe that 
just looking at the oil prices is a very myopic view of looking at things. I think uh, India as a country, in fact, world, uh, you know, uh, has already started this journey towards cleaner mobility, and uh, the direction is definitely towards electric vehicles. Uh, yes, maybe a year or two here or there because of the investments uh, uh, part of it, but uh, but I see yes, we will still definitely move towards towards EVs. Yes, sir. thank you. Really, you see, as far as the EV is concerned, Delhi is far, but nazar kahin na kahin aa rahi hai Delhi. So it will come. It probably will get postponed slightly. Coming to you, Mr. Guleria, you know, electric vehicles have made no impact as far as the passenger four wheelers. Although there's a lot of noise of too many models being launched, hardly 300 vehicles per month were sold last year, and uh, it actually went down from the previous year. But in when I see two wheelers, although the proportion is still very small, they were the numbers were fairly respectable as compared to four wheelers. So, do you see this trend of electric vehicles coming faster in? In two wheelers, and is this owner and subscription model working there? Because ride sharing and ride, uh, you know, people can own a two wheeler. Is these trends will come in the industry or not? The way you see two wheeler, and I'm talking the mass market. They will be certain, you could say certain segments or certain niche which will be there. But I'm talking if you take the mass market as a whole, which we take 17 million two wheeler industry to make an impact. Yeah, I think uh, the talk around EV has been there for quite uh, quite a long time, and uh, the, you mentioned about numbers, but at the same time we are also talking about the market of two wheeler or the IC engine itself, which was very close to reaching the 20, 20 million mark annual sales as well. So considering that, like unfortunately because of the last year 18 percent uh, degrowth in the two wheeler IC engine industry, the numbers were lower, but India as a two-wheeler market, the world's largest IC engine two-wheeler market has a big and large potential still to grow. So it may happen there is an ecosystem which is created when both of them are growing. But at the same time, it is very, um, very important to analyze that there were more than 50 makers who came and they almost, I think, how many of them closed down the shop, how many of the dealership have closed down the shop is also there is no analysis on that. So we have a very filtered kind of information and there may be some lobby also who would like to promote that thing. But uh, first is that are the people really making that choice as an informed choice for contributing towards the environment? I would say maybe less than 10% or only 1% today. It will change. Definitely, I agree with what Mr. Tarun is saying and what uh, the COVID has brought about that everybody is introspecting and we have to be more towards uh, uh, you know working on more greener vehicle but what is then bs4 to bs6 was that not a, not having a sing, you know jump of bs5 in between and within 3 years which has not happened anywhere across the globe that there has been one step of emission norms totally taken away and the industry lived up to that uh, drive of the government and participated and jumped from 2017 to 2020 in you know jumping from the technology or from no carburetor today in the country all the two wheelers are with now uh, fuel injection so that has also significantly contribute to the greener uh, environment so let's let's see it because at the same time now we are talking about economic package stimulus for the auto industry not only about the fuel price across the globe. We'll come to the stimulus, sir. Uh, we'll come to the stimulus in the next part of the discussion. Yeah. So if there is a scrappage policy, if there is something around that, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. In the IC engine industry as well. So lot has to be bridged in terms of the infrastructure to support the market for the two wheelers. You know, about rural. If we larger population of two wheelers is in the rural India, then the infrastructure to support the electrification is also very weak so okay. uh, and performance of the vehicle so two wheeler is not only used for uh, you know only one single per person today there is a lot of loading which happens but the performance of the electric vehicle also goes down so the over the years definitely the performance of the electrical electric vehicle are going to improve the range may improve so all, with all those things slowly that acceptance will start come up uh, coming in but still, it is a long way to really catch up or replace the IC. Yeah, in the two points I get from you. One is you're asking a very basic question. We have gone from BS4 to BS6. 
present it added to more greener because most of the pollution which comes from is the older vehicles or the vehicles where the scrappy policy is to come. The second part you're mentioning is the ecosystem. This has to come up. We have about 700 plus districts. And the third part you're mentioning is the two wheelers, which most of them have been told are be the single person driven, which is not the model, the way in the market operates. Coming to your Ramki, I need a short rejoinder. Is electric an answer? There is some movement in electric, which you see in buses, but it is more in the OPEX model, not in the CAPEX model, because neither the government nor the state undertakings have this thing. Will electric come in, in the commercial vehicle space? And if it comes, which is the part of the segment where you think it will come faster? So, Arun, quickly, if I look at the entire spectrum of commercial vehicles, the buses, we are seeing electric vehicles, driven, of course, by a subsidy from the government. And if a bill of subsidy continues, it can become commercially viable. There could be, therefore, a certain amount of penetration in city buses. It, of course, needs the associated infrastructure. Moving to the uh, trucks, trucks which are applying within the city, short range, could possibly be converted to electric vehicles, vehicles like a municipality vehicle, garbage uh, transportation, water tankers, and so on, potential candidates. If you take long distance, unless you have long distance charging infrastructure, or the way electric trains run, continuously connected to an overhead uh, cable, the long distance truck is not going to convert to electric. In the smaller vehicles, however, which run in a shorter range, the potential is a lot more. And where it's not necessarily requiring a lithium ion battery and can run with a lead acid battery, as indeed we have seen with some two wheelers and three wheelers, it's potentially possible that quite a lot of them, which are predominantly used within a city or within small radiuses of 50 kilometers, Quite a number of them could actually convert to electric vehicles and economically so. So uh, you're clearly saying electric vehicles uh, is a movement, but it's still very early days. Now coming to a very important piece, you know, the government has to play a role. Generally, there is a feedback and this is a frank thing that it's the most highly taxed industry. Your vehicles are taxed at the rate, the minimum tax is 28%, which goes up to 45%. Even uh, early, you can say entry level two wheeler or a com small commercial vehicle is taxed at the same rate. And FADA had written to the Prime Minister highlighting changes they require. This industry to be given a separate status, MSMECs to be treated, special uh, subventions given. Now, coming from each one of you, if I have to take four points, and uh, Mr. Menon is also hearing, and probably he'll take those points again, there are a lot of things the government has to do. But if you have to put your top four points, what you require the government to operate in or help this industry in descending order will go straight. Straight to Tarun. Top only four points what you want the government to do, which should impact the okay, sir, uh, I would say the taxation, the, the GST on auto, automobiles, uh, the, uh, the scrappage policy uh, definitely mm -hmm. will solve a lot of issues. Thirdly, I think government has to really nudge the banks towards lending, 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 lending. While government has done a lot on the repo rate reduction, uh, so liquidity is not an issue, but I believe uh, automobile dealers will need funds and banks will have to really come forward and really lend them and so that they, the business can start. So that is the, uh, that is the uh, third part of it. And fourth part is definitely we will need because we will need a positive sentiment. Of whatever I think these four things probably for the four wheeler industry could be my four. Uh, request to the government. So you're saying taxation is one. You yes. clearly said if the both start with L. One is liquidity, which a government is doing, but the liquidity is not translating into lending. So you should start measuring lending. What you can measure can only improve. And second, you saw is put a positive sentiment because it's about sentimental. Coming to you, uh, Yadrinder, three things the government should do, whether from for the dealer or for the industry. Three top four points which you think. I think Mr. Tarun has already made my task easier. So I will say first tick mark, yes, because we have to first generate the demand. If the customers start buying, that's the most important thing. So to generate demand, okay, if the price become competitive and it is GST is re-looked into taxation is re-looked into, two, then there will be a demand generation. And second is obviously, again, uh, the point is liquidity around both for working capital for the dealers and also with the NBFC so that the rate of interest comes down. And again, from the user point of view, 
his rate of interest to buy a two wheeler four wheeler is getting reduced and cost of buying is reduced so that is the second thing which is there and lastly from the administrative point of view though we had talked about lot of vahan portal and other things and rto and very smooth movement of inter broad interstate uh, transport as you mentioned in the beginning of this uh, seminar webinar itself uh, about the uh, gst and non border smooth uh, but the ground reality is you know far from the you know it is very very different okay, so you're saying this is if you are having a fast tag you are the slowest in the line uh, in the toll if you have the fast tag so okay. now this is very important that if there should not be any physical requirement of the dealership to go whether it is regarding hsrp and all that also uh, lead to a lot of cost administrative cost at the dealership so smooth rto operation means administrative work at the dealership also will bring down the cost of manpower everything will happen digitally so registration should happen online and everything no physical Ramji, if you put your four demands or four requirements what the government should act on which they have not acted on so again, Arun, i would put number one is infrastructure growth infrastructure <laughs> has a ripple effect it immediately generates demand for commercial vehicles the resultant road network leads to movement of goods as well as people expansion of cities expansion of towns and it is a ripple effect of growth which will feed the economy multiple times the second i would say is in the interests of emission as well as in the interests of the commercial vehicle industry including dealers announce the scrappage norms so that the old vehicles are taken out which are polluting to an extent as well as less fuel efficient than the modern generation vehicles that will put better the third i would say is please cut down the gst the commercial vehicles are transporting the country's economic produce they are not luxury goods please cut down the gst so that more people can buy and transport and the last i would say is please cut down the interest rates so that an entrepreneur can buy and pay as installments without finding it too taxing so i find two links which are common across all the three segments interest rates and gst and Ra and ramki mentioned about infrastructure spends because if infrastructure spends happen the wheels of the nation will start moving and also he talked of scrappage which has been discussed for a long time but uh, probably it's not brought to the table because who will bear the expense dealers and company can be a part of it but there has to be a major bone expense by the government either in forms of gst or in terms of sales tax now i'm coming to the last segment and i only want you to give marks and uh, you have to put your hand to your heart can i have all the participants put hand to the heart we have it we have in court so the question is you have to give it from a scale of 1 to 10 huh generally there is a charge that you know there is not much collaboration between dealers and oems because they say that there is too much professionalism in in uh, manufacturers and relationships have taken a back seat so if i have to judge the level of collaboration now between manufacturers and dealers oems and dealers what would you put on a scale of 1 to 10 10 is the highest 1 0 is the lowest so tarun score from your side no no explanation just a score 7 uh, uh, Seven. So he's so seven is a good marks. Although you don't get good admission in good universities, in seven out of ten. Okay, coming to you, Ramki. And you're not talking for your company. You're talking for the industry. So don't uh, feel guilty about it. You fine. Huh? Eight, eight out of ten. Eleven. Eight. Oh, that's a very good score. Gloria. Okay, I I have uh, you haven't given me a choice, but keeping my you know hand on my heart, I have two things to say. There is a Nini, always a difference. First, yeah, then there you have to give a score first. Then you come to what you have to say. Okay. So first is seven out of ten, but okay. I go with Ramki uh, eight out of ten because there is always a difference between intention and perception. Because we are talking about dealer and principal relation. So with intention and perception difference seven out of ten, but as an intention, it is eight out of ten. So the very good scores coming. So you are saying one thing we are hearing intent is there. but sometimes the intent is not you know doesn't convert into reality and probably in challenging times the gaps widen because everybody is in stress so everybody looks at the other person is responsible for it but i would just like to put one line you know there's a very interesting line in a film song in the 80s which shows a close relationship which says tera haath mere haath mein ho agar to ye safar bhi asal hayat hai to tera haath mere haath mein are we able to hold hands and to go together the last question which i am putting in score 1 to 10 is there is not a gloom and do and generally it happens when you pass through tough time people say the industry is finished but always the industry is hit back 
Suppose you have to see that the industry has to come back to 2018 and 19 level, not to 19 and 20 because it's fallen. How much years do you think it will take or how many months it will take? Ramki, starting from you now. To come back to 2018 and 19 level. So how much you have to give it in duration in months or years if you want to give it? 24 to 30 months. 24 to 30 months, okay. Yadvinder, your score. Yeah, I have to go to Bejan Daruwala and then ask him. Daruwala you can go to, but based on your marketing acumen of last 20 years, because generally we've seen when industry has gone down, two years it has come back. There's a psychic swing. What's your idea? Because Yeah, so 24 months. 24 months. And Tarun? Yes, I'll go with 24 months. And I think we have enough evidence in India. Uh, uh, every time, auto industry in India has really come back very strong, very strongly, especially passenger vehicles. So I have no reason to believe that in two years we should be back to 18, 19. And you gave us a very tough task, sir. 18, 19 volume. So yeah, yeah, 19, I said 19, 20. Yeah. <laughs> if it had fallen 20%, you would have said six, eight months. But yeah. again, something we should go back to. That should be a wish list, whether from the dealers, whether from manufacturers or info OEMs. So thank yes. you very much, participants. I'd just like to sum up what's come into a very discussion before we come to the questions. I think the key point which is emerging is that this is the time of COVID-19 is a time for reckoning. Sometimes you realize your problems, your challenges much sharper. So sometimes it's a blessing in disguise. So we are talking a stronger relationship between manufacturer dealers, dealers to do more financial discipline, dealers and manufacturers to ensure that we cut down on productive expenses, whether they're rentals or whether they are on interest rates and how to bring more productivity, more efficiency, more output. And how do we penetrate it faster? And then the government has to play. This is the barometer of the industry. This is the industry which shares the sentiment of the country. If you are doing well in the auto industry, the country's economy is in full gear. So the government has to take very strong action. I think Mr. Menon and CM is following up. Even FAD is following up. So thank you to the panelists. But we'll come to the questions now. So there are a lot of questions. Uh, we'll forward. My only request to the panelists is, can we have the answers in a short, crisp answers? So. Let's start with the question straight away. How do you think after sales will be changed with the current business scenario? Uh, Who will try to answer that? Uh, Ramki, since you had the global head of commercial vehicles in, in the world for Tata Motors, I'd like you to answer this question. There will be a lot more uh, electronics and digital in the after sales area. However, I think the after sales will ramp up much faster than the new vehicle sales. And it will grow faster in the commercial vehicle space. Okay, good. The second question is post COVID-19, do you think owning a vehicle will make a major comeback against the shared vehicle? Because shared vehicle was gaining segment and there was a lot of cry that shared vehicles will take the care of old vehicles. Because of personal, will it come back very strongly? Tarun. Yeah. So sir, frankly, shared, while there's a lot of talk about shared vehicle, but as a percentage, if you see shared, shared vehicle as a percentage of the total industry, the figures were not really very significant. So I think it was more being talked about. That is one part of it. But yes, uh, post-COVID, I feel that uh, personal mobility will really see a big, big uh, positive boost. And let us all uh, understand that car penetration in India is still 27 per thousand only. So I see a lot of people really coming into the fold, which will lead uh, uh, a positive change in the entry level also. So I think for, for the overall industry, I think it's going to be very, very positive. So Tarun is saying the Indian growth story is intact. The penetrations are low. And clearly the personal vehicle space definitely will take a thing. Now whether it's the cost of shared vehicles, but that will definitely get a momentum. Next question is a very, somebody wants the exact percentage. Uh, they are saying, what is the percentage cost of a digital showroom vis a vis a brick and mortar showroom? How much expenses can come down? Yadinder, or you would like to answer or Tarun? Julia, I think Julia showed a, a slide on this. Answer this. Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't put a question to you, Julia. You have to answer this. What is the percentage cost of a digital showroom? This is a brick and mortar showroom. Assuming the same level of efficiency and output. So you have to give a figure. So really, it depends how. It depends on, uh, are you looking at the square footage or uh, at the expenses oh, of the people? Cost, so cost it's, area, output and efficiency has to be the same. So cost is the criteria only. 
It's probably the possibility of a reduction of cost at about 60%. Well, that's a major reduction. But it's going to be painful. Uh, it's going to take a lot of the items that you have touched upon earlier around um, the stress and the strain on dealerships. So, Julia, since you are there with us, one question which I forgot to ask you. We had asked this question to all the panelists. How much time do you think the industry will come back in 2018 and 19 in India? Mm -hmm. Now, you have a global answer. How much <laughs> once or in Yes, I mean, if we're looking at 2019 numbers, we actually expect uh, 10 to 12 months. So quarter one, 2021, we're expecting a recovery. So I run these across APAC, Europe, and uh, overall the economy expected for vehicles 2021 quarter one. Okay, so we were just comparing with 18, 19 because we made a financial year April to March 19. Correct. So you're saying 12, 14 months? So my panelists here in India are more, you can say, pessimistic. They're talking about 24 months, which is there. Okay, what measures will be required immediately by dealers after lockdown gets over? Uh, I you, yeah, you could so. answer that. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I'll go really, really quickly. I think uh, consumers will really expect some sort of contactless options. I'm not saying everything digital, but the options of really having the safety of sanitization of having safe rooms, even after lockdown, of having test drives maybe at their home. So all of the little elements without going big investments, everything that dealers can do now will be expected later. And I think one of the points um, that Mr. Malota will be very important is the health, wellness and well-being concern of customers. So this will not only reflect within the dealership, but also from a vehicle point of view. So the monitoring of the physical health of the passengers and the drivers will be really important. And also the sanitizing of the vehicle, the, the purifying of air criteria of the vehicle. So this is good because it brings people back into the dealership because the dealership has a role there. So their health and well-being will be an important part. Another question, which I think comes straight to you. This has been discussed for a long time. Multi-brand showrooms will come into the vogue, which has discussed long back. You know, various companies did it, it didn't happen. Do you think post-COVID-19, you can see a return to the multi-brand showroom as against standalone uh, brand showrooms? Julia? Uh, not, not necessarily, to be honest, because um, it is more the, the, the format, probably, of the showroom that will change. So in, in many cases, it might actually mean a reduction of the showroom rather than plugging in more cars if we're looking at urban area. However, if we're looking at rural area, I think there is scope for the multi-brand um, perspective. So I think, um, Mr. Malota, we need to look at urban, where I think multi-brand is not necessarily the way to go, and urban, where I think there is a scope across brands and vehicle segments. So you're saying the multi before multi-brand, you're talking of downsizing in terms of infrastructure, which you can do multi-brand probably in very remote rural areas. One next question to Mr. Guleria. Digital, do you think it will help us to expand our rural market or it's just a buzzword in terms of operational efficiency? That's the question. Seeing by the trend, even in uh, states like Bihar or Uttar Pradesh, where many of the dealers have already actively used the digital in this time of COVID to connect with their customer to remain top of their mind, I believe it is it will make inroads even in rural, but the pace of penetration probably may be a little slower than what we have seen in the urban India, but it is going to happen and spread its wings. Okay, thank you. Uh, la next question to Tarun. They say yes. this work from home concept will hit the passenger vehicle, two wheelers and four wheelers badly. Because everybody work from home, why do they need to transport vehicles? Why do they need vehicle to move around? Because everybody will work. So work from home can be a stumbling block. This concept of work from home, which has started in the growth of the passenger <laughs> industry. Uh, uh, in fact, I have a slightly different perspective on this and I'd like to share some data on this. Uh, uh, in fact, if you see, if you see the car uh, running, uh, running of cars in India, so far, uh, average customer runs the car only for 800 to 1000. They use public transport to go to office. And uh, of course, they use uh, cars maybe only at the weekend or maybe if they have to attend a marriage. So on the contrary, I would believe that, well, yes, you're right. 
uh, in some way uh, work from home will affect the market at the other end there would be so many people who would really want to own the car and they would want to travel because the, 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 uh, ultimately a human being is a social animal and i think you will really want to meet people you will really want to go and see people you will want to eat out in fact i was uh, i was listening to some uh, reading some studies which have been done on the customer sentiment i think there is something called a uh, revenge shopping i think last 40 days have also taught us that yes while while we <laughs> have adopted we have adopted to these new ways at the same time we really want to go out we really want to go out so i think that social being in us will not stop and we will want to travel and we will want to travel in our own space so i think there are positives there are some hindrances all in all car penetration in india is too low and i still feel that i don't think we have anything to worry from work from home as it is okay so uh, do you agree mr gulegia with this or anything you want to say differently yeah if we all uh, remember this incidence of a rich guy's son just in the lockdown took out his car for a spin <laughs> even in the lockdown it it shows what uh, it is basically an evidence of that we being a social animal it's not only you know physical movement it is sometimes personal or social movement also which mobility brings in and this mobility of four wheeler or a mobility on two wheels it is all about physical personal and social mobility so that's that's what i have to you know say on this point okay and last question um uh, this question is to ramki they are saying since in the commercial vehicle there is a lot of dependence on the nbfcs and what arun understands nbfc also have funds today as far as we are concerned what is what do you want the nbfcs to do what is your wish list of nbfcs from nbfcs to revive the market that's Two question things. asked one make interest rates attractive for people to buy two while you are applying your due diligence no one's denying that you should do it be a little more liberal so that more people can acquire commercial vehicles improve your collection mechanism so that you don't have defaulters this is what drives the economy okay so that's one thing and uh, we'll come to the last question which is there and which again to your amki will the logistics the way the logistics getting organized will it be a philip to the commercial vehicle industry most certainly yes so most so we see efficiencies so ramki saying more sir yes so we come to the end of the question answers so if i have to sum up a brilliant presentation by julia which showed that there is a lot of initiatives and unique best practices in the digital space what's happening in the online and offline model which can be combined beautifully uh it was also shared uh, by madhavan that how we can how it is they also started in green shoots i think most of the people did agree that we have challenges it's been a tough time but i think the oems and the dealers are ready to introspect and look and what can be done better and the various stakeholders the number of stakeholders it's the dealer it is the manufacturer it is the financer it is the government and last but not least is the customer so we play our cards right we are in difficult times challenging times but this is a time for purification to tend to to you know if i would take a gettysburg speech or lincoln a time to rededicate ourselves to the last big cause which remains for us so we enter a positive note the woods are lovely dark and deep but we have many promises to keep and i believe the promises which seem very far away or the woods which seem very far away will come closer thank you very much thank you all the panelists and thank you siam for for uh, uh, arranging this discussion sorry we could take 10 12 questions all the questions were flowing thank you very much thank, thank you, you mr malhotra thank you very much thank you thank you very thank much. you all thank you, thank you everyone